I've been uh, actually on the staff at UH since 1990 as an internist and as an addiction consultant. Uh, when you're a detox doctor, when you're a physician who runs detox units and, and you work uh, as, a, uh, as an addiction consultant to the med surge hospitals, it's not uncommon on Monday mornings uh, about uh, 6 in the morning uh, to get a page saying, we didn't want to bother you on Sunday for this kind of patient. Uh, but there's a patient in the surgical ICU who came in on Saturday night with a gunshot wound to the chest, now has a chest tube, heroin in the urine. There's something about Saturday night, heroin in the urine, Northeast Ohio, and gunshot wounds to the chest that go together. I don't know what it is. And the patient has gotten more and more uh, um, out of control and just recently uh, has thrown a urinal at the surgical house officer with the lid open. And that usually is the trigger for an addiction consult. Um, how do we manage the patient's pain? And so ever since I've been uh, doing addiction medicine and, and ever since I've been a, a consultant to the med surge services, going all the way back to 1985 at Baltimore City and Johns Hopkins Hospital, these kinds of things happen all the time. So I'm gonna share with you first a few uh, principles about how to think about the addictive brain and how to think about controlled drugs. Uh, because we need principles in order to guide sort of algorithms and patient management strategies. And then I'm going to run through um, uh, sort of the typical uh, questions um, that come up with a post-operative um, patient or a patient with an acute pain syndrome um, uh, who has an addictive uh, brain uh, and, uh, and how to sort of noodle through that. Whoa, so that didn't work. Let me try. There we go. Um, so first of all, there's a big difference between a person who's a substance abuser, which is what's always written in the medical record, and a person with addiction, chemical dependency, substance use disorder, moderate or severe. When you have a patient who um, is in DTs, they don't have alcohol abuse. Uh, first semester sophomore in college is the definition of alcohol abuse. Uh, before people realize they have to major in something other than beer if they want to amount to anything in life. That's alcohol abuse. So don't use abuse when you're dealing with a person with addiction. Put down substance use disorder, moderate or severe, if you like the DSM-5, um, or put down uh, chemical dependency or uh, opiate addiction or opiate dependence or whatever you want to put down, but don't put down abuse. Abuse is a person who plans to binge at a party and get hammered and then they go do it um, and that's sort of called being in a fraternity uh, or a sorority uh, in college and there's nothing in, in common between that and the disease of addiction. Um, uh, a person uh, with addiction has developed a tolerance, they often have developed physical dependence uh, and they are out of control with their behavior. A person with alcohol abuse says it's Friday night and it's, you know, uh, X kind of party and I'm going to get this much drunk with this number of my friends and we're going to do this number of wild and crazy things, watch me. And sure enough, they do exactly what they say. It may be dangerous, it may result in, in assault, uh, it may result in drunken disorderly conduct, it may get people kicked out of college, but it's a behavior. A person with addiction has an intermittent, inconsistent, repetitive loss of control over their use of a euphoria producing drug that results in repeated adverse consequences in their life. People with addiction are out of control. It's not volitional after the first use. Uh, the rest is sort of, um, sort of a brainstem that kicks in. So there's tolerance. Uh, pretty much anybody can develop tolerance if they use over time. Physiologic dependence is just a physiologic state. If anybody's worked in pain management uh, for a while and you've had some patients who are pretty stable on long-term, you know, reasonably low doses of opioids, they're physically dependent. Uh, if they abruptly stop their opioids, they have withdrawal. If you pop them with naloxone, you know, by accident, uh, you'll precipitate withdrawal. But they're not acting like a person who's out of control with addiction. Uh, addiction is, a, is, uh, is the hallmark of addiction is not the physiologic state of physical dependence, but the out-of-control behaviors that happen when people uh, binge on their substances. Um, and this is, uh, 
This is a short definition of addiction uh, from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, but it basically is a person who loses control over, over dopamine surge agency, a agents. Um, this is a slightly longer definition, but this is still considered their short definition of addiction. It's way too long. My definition of addiction is anybody who has an intermittent, unpredictable, but repeated loss of control over any dopamine surge agent, any agent that produces a dopamine surge from the midbrain to the forebrain and gets into trouble around it is a person with addiction. So the person who drinks too much on weekends when they plan not to has alcoholism. They may not have physical dependence, but they can't predict when they're going to drink too much and get in trouble with their spouse, their kids, uh, their DUIs, their whatever. Um, and the person who's sort of a relentless daily user uh, who swears that they're not going to keep using every day but continues to is also a person uh, with addictive disease. So this, I'm embarrassed to say, but this is the brain uh, to a general internist. Um, uh, I know where coordination lives, you know, way there in the back near the brain stem, and I know that vision is straight back, and I worry a lot as an internal medicine doc about that sort of, sort of middle cerebral, ar cerebral artery uh, uh, motor sensory strip. Um, but just remember where judgment, memory, and reward live. And that's where all of the substances of abuse and addiction that we know of work. That's where alcohol works. And anywhere where alcohol works, that's where benzos work and barbiturates work. Because benzos and barbiturates are just alcohol in a, in a tablet or a pill or an IV infusion. So that's where the sedative hypnotics work. That's where the opiates work. That's where the psychostimulants work. That's where marijuana works. That's where medical marijuana, which is called marijuana, works. Um, that's just where they work. It's not their primary brain effect. The primary brain effect of opioids, you guys know better than I do, uh, involves uh, uh, mu receptors and at higher doses, involves a lot of brain stem effects that you guys take, care, take advantage of therapeutically when you're putting people out or putting people under. Um, so the primary brain effect of opioids is in totally different parts of the brain than the nucleus accumbens um, going to the ventral tegmental, or ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens to the prefrontal cortex. But all opioids, whether they are tramadol, Nucenta, uh, the mu agonist or the kappa agonist, all opioids also produce a dopamine surge from the midbrain to the forebrain and therefore they pr produce euphoria. Same thing with the benzos, same thing with the uh, psychostimulants, uh, same thing with the cannabinoids, the four major groups of euphoria producing drugs. Now some people think that there's lots of euphoria producing drugs uh, in the world. Um, uh, and some of them may be true uh, and some of them aren't. Uh, but this is actually from a Chicago newspaper and I've been boycotting Chicago ever since we lost in the World Series. So uh, we'll skip that. Uh, this is where all any controlled drug that you will ever write for in your life in a prescription or in a hospital order the reason why it's a controlled drug is because it precipitates an acute surge of dopamine from the midbrain to the forebrain and therefore it produces euphoria that's not the therapeutic purpose you're using it for but that's why it's a controlled drug that's that's why people drink beer wine and liquor, that's why people snort cocaine, that's why people, you know, chew a Vicodin along with a couple of beers at a fraternity party for a nice hydrocodone, uh, you know, uh, Anheuser-Busch buzz. Um, that's what euphoria producing drugs do um, in their euphoria producing aspect. And as I said, we use them therapeutically for their other aspects, but we have to keep in mind that this is what it is. When I ask most interns and residents, what is it about a drug? that makes it a controlled drug. Some, you know, PGY1 who's randomly awake at the moment sort of raises their hand and says, because you got to put a DEA number on it. And then if later in the talk I say, what is it about a, about a prescription or a medication, which pharmacologically, which requires you to put your DEA number on it, some other intern or resident who's randomly awake at the moment will raise their hand and say, because it's a controlled drug. And that's it in terms of the pharmacologic knowledge of most prescribers about why you have to put, sh why I have to put AP2553750 on Ativan and on Adderall. 
even though they have totally different primary effects in the brain. Most people have no clue that the reason why it's a controlled drug is because it produces a dopamine surge. And people with addiction can't longitudinally, repetitively, reproducibly control dopamine surge experiences. Now that has a lot more impact on the cr management of chronic pain, chronic anxiety, chronic insomnia, chronic ADD in people with addiction, not so much with acute, and I'll get to acute issues uh, shortly. But when it comes to chronic prescribing of controlled drugs, if a patient has an addictive brain, it's a really bad idea. It's just a really bad idea to chronically prescribe controlled drugs, dopamine surge agents, to a person with an addictive brain. So who in America has an addictive brain? About 10%. Between one out of eight and one out of 10. Whether you're eating dinner tonight at one of the two federal housing projects next to St. Vincent Charity Hospital, or I helped to run Rosary Hall, or you're having dinner tonight in Hunting Valley, Ohio, which before the 1973 Arab oil embargo was the highest income zip code on earth, was Hunting Valley, Ohio. Doesn't matter, it's still 10%, uh, 10 to 12%. So between one out of 10 and one out of eight Americans, if they choose to chase the elusive Miller time, or if they get long-term prescriptions for a controlled drug, they'll eventually sacrifice their self-image, self-respect, marriages, relationships with their kids, financial stability, legal standing in the community, on the altar of either that controlled drug prescription or, you know, uh, Miller time. Uh, and that's just called addiction. The other nine out of 10, you can give them a garage full of Dilaudid and they will never, four milligram trade name, and they will never go to the garage because it's full of a bunch of pills. You can't even park your car there unless they have really bad pain. And then they'll go to the garage and they'll take less Dilaudid than you recommended. That's the, you know, eight or nine out of 10 Americans. And one out of 10 Americans, if they get a garage full of Dilaudid, they will move into the garage and they will live there at the expense of every other meaningful relationship in their life until the garage is empty. Uh, and then they'll go around and cut a little hole with a hatchet in every other garage door in the neighborhood just in case there's a relationship between garages and Dilaudid. Uh, and that's called addiction. Same substance, Dilaudid, same institution, a garage, totally bifurcated behavior systems based upon the brain that the patient has, not on the substance. And that's why it can be so confusing and, uh, and, and difficult when thinking about prescribing controlled drugs, using controlled drugs, administering controlled drugs to patients uh, in clinical care. Because we can't base our decisions purely based on the medicine, which is what we typically do in heart failure, right? You kind of look at a person with heart failure and then you pick your best medicine at the moment. You know, is it flash pulmonary edema and is it a night pride drip or whatever you guys do now? Or, you know, is it a little stable chronic uh, uh, heart failure and you're going to bump the Lasix a little bit? You typically pick your substance based upon the characteristics of the drug, almost always. When it comes to controlled drugs, the primary decision, especially for chronic controlled drug administration, is are you dealing with a high risk brain or a low risk brain? Because high-risk drugs mixed with low-risk brains result in low-risk behavior. And high-risk drugs, controlled drugs, mixed with high-risk brains, people with substance use disorders, lead to high-risk behavior. Um, and ac acute prescribing is less of a risk, which is, thank goodness, because, you know, otherwise we'd all be having a very tough time around perioperative things and acute pain syndromes. But with chronic pain syndromes, it's very real. So the criteria for legal prescribing, uh, you know, physicians, uh, uh, physician assistants, advanced practice nurses, um, maybe in some states, psychologists uh, can prescribe. Um, pharmacies tend to distribute, right? So pharmacies are distributors, we're prescribers. Nurses are administrators. Nurses administrate the medicine, administer the medicine. Uh, we prescribe them um, and pharmacists dispense them. And it's good to have that sort of division of powers, if you will. I get nervous about practices that stock a lot of in-house meds and work as their own in-house pharmacy to quote unquote, make it more convenient for the patient. 
because now you have the prescriber and the dispenser and sometimes the administrator all in the same office, all paid by the same person, all with not necessarily separate financial interests. And when I was, uh, when I was reviewing an awful lot of pain clinics uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s for federal prosecutors around the country, um, you know, the pain clinics that demanded $200 in cash for every visit regardless of your insurance status and had in-house pharmacies and also demanded that you pay cash for your prescriptions that they prescribed and then filled within the pharmacies were some really problematic places that were very difficult to call um, the usual course of medical practice. So speaking of which, uh, let's talk about legal prescribing. To legally prescribe a controlled drug federally, you have to prescribe within the usual course of medical practice for a legitimate medical purpose. Those are the two phrases that federal prosecutors think about when they think about controlled drug prescribing. Did it take place within the usual course of medical practice for a legitimate medical purpose? So what's the usual course of medical practice? Having a prescriber-patient relationship. Um, so that's like seeing the patient, you know, and, you know, doing an exam and, you know, having a diagnosis and those sorts of things. And the typical things that you look for in a chart, and this is all pretty basic, this is like second year med school kind of um, physical diagnosis stuff, is that an H&P was done and an assessment was done and an individualized treatment plan was done, et cetera. So when I would look at a, at, a, at, a, at a practice where every single patient got 30 milligrams of immediate release oxycodone, uh, you know, six tabs a day, and, uh, and three tabs a day of immediate release 15 milligrams of oxycodone, and four tabs a day of four milligrams Xanax, I mean two milligrams Xanax for their anxiety, and then uh, everybody was on 10 milligrams of Zolpidem a night, regardless of their history and physical, you started worrying about whether there was an individualized treatment plan. Um, and then when they continued to get it, despite the cocaine in their urine toxicology screens, uh, and the lack of oxycodone, or oxycodone was there, but oxymorphone, the first level metabolite of oxycodone is, is opana, oxymorphone. So anybody who's regularly taking their oxycodone should have a almost similar level of oxymorphone in their quantitative serum tox screen. And a patient who has oxycodone in their urine and no oxymorphone is a person who spiked their urine the night before they were coming to the clinic to have a normal urine tox screen, but who doesn't regularly take it. Um, they're supporting their, themselves in the manner to which they've grown to become accustomed uh, by diverting the oxycodone. Or they just like to save it, um, which is uncommon. For a legitimate medical purpose. So what's a legitimate medical purpose? You know, of course, it's a, it's a diagnosis, right? What's the diagnosis? Um, legitimate medical purposes are based on establishing an indication and having a lack of contraindications, right? Because you can't have a legitimate medical purpose to give a person dilantin if they've, you know, defoliated uh, or exfoliated their entire skin in the past when they got dilantin. That would be a, such a strong contraindication that you'd never give them dilantin again. Um, if a person, you know, has a, has, has a pretty bad uh, allergic reaction to, um, to psyllins, um, you wouldn't say, well, gosh, you got a strep throat. And they'd say, well, I'm allergic to psyllins. And you say, well, here's some amoxicillin and 50 of Benadryl and a Medrol dose pack and an EpiPen. We'd, we'd never do that. We'd just pick some other antibiotic for the strep throat. Well, if a person has a pain situation, especially a chronic pain situation, and they have hep C, and they have fairly carefully hidden track marks behind their tattoos, and they've done time in state penitentiary for diverting opioids um, for methamphetamine, saying, well, but they still have chronic pain, and I need to treat their pain and send them with, home with opiates to go, is just like giving a person with a penicillin allergy uh, Benadryl and an EpiPen and a Medrol dose pack. It's like, well, sorry, but we, you're, your contraindication going to prison to receiving long-term opioids is such a strong contraindication that it sort of trumps the indication. And we'll treat your chronic pain, but we can't use long-term opioids for that person's chronic pain management. And that's not what's done in the usual course of practice in Northeast Ohio or North America. 
What's done in Northeast Ohio or North America is to say, well, you know, why don't you have your wife hold your opiates for you and just dole them out to you, as if addiction is pediatrics. You know, and peds, of course, when you've got bubblegum flavored amoxicillin, you've got to have the parents dole it out. Otherwise, the kid's just going to eat the whole bottle because it tastes like bubblegum. But in addiction, the, the rate of domestic violence in families with addiction is 300% higher than the rate of domestic violence in non-addictive families. And asking a spouse or a significant other to stand between a patient with addiction and their lover called their dopamine surge agent that we're prescribing is just plain goofy once we think about it. But if we don't think about it, we say, oh, well, you know, let's just have someone else sort of control it for you. So indications and contraindications is the key. And again, I'm going to make just a couple more comments about chronic pain management, and then I'm going to transition to the implications of these things for acute pain management in a patient you know, who's, who's unlucky and has an addictive brain, and also unlucky and has an acute you know, uh, pain syndrome. So I'll, I'll make that transition in just a minute before you think that uh, somebody did the bait and switch on you here this morning for the topic. Um, so is there a clear diagnosis of chronic intractable pain? Uh, that doesn't mean always that there's, a, there's an indication um, for a legitimate medical purpose for a long-term opiate. And this is where I've seen a fair number of people who run pain clinics get themselves in trouble. So if a patient isn't showing up for physical therapy, they've never shown up for occupational therapy, but they act like they're from Chicago when it comes to your office visits, they vote early and often, uh, you prescribe a month's supply and they're back in two weeks, they're back in three weeks, the dog ate it, they left it in West Virginia, it spilled in Lake Erie when they were bass fishing, et cetera, et cetera. So they're coming repetitively and often early for controlled drug prescriptions, but they're not following through with anything else in the, uh, in the um, uh, treatment plan. Um, and uh, you have evidence uh, that they have an addictive brain, a previous history of alcoholism, chronic pancreatitis would be a good one. You can't get chronic pancreatitis without having alcoholism. But we treat chronic, at least in the 1980s when I was an intern. In 82 when I was an intern, I was taught there's only one chronic pain syndrome that requires opiates. That was it. In the 80s, we never gave opiates for chronic pain ever. If you did, as a house officer, you'd get the Three Stooges dope slap and be told to go back to med school. Um, they just said, just don't do it because something bad's gonna happen to you and your patient. They never told us what bad was gonna happen, but they just said, just don't do it. Except for chronic pancreatitis. Isn't it weird that the only chronic pain you couldn't get without having an addictive brain was the only one we were taught to treat as a Demerol deficiency disorder? You know, 300, 600 milligrams of PO Demerol a day for everybody with chronic pancreatitis. Um, but, you know, if you had, you know, if you had a, uh, a failed laminectomy syndrome and no history of addiction, you know, you were getting acetaminophen and, and uh, 800 milligrams of ibuprofen back then because that was the strongest available dose. And a pat on the back and an admonition to get a back rub when you go home. Um, so the world has changed since 1980, but I think uh, some, things, uh, some things have stayed the same. People with addictive brains who get long-term exposure to controlled drugs actually deteriorate in their function. And the bottom line ethical principles of the practice, practice of medicine, if you sort of take the Hippocratic Oath and you boil it down to its basic essentials is, above all, first do no harm, and then comfort always, and at least in internal medicine, cure rarely. Um, my dear colleagues in orthopedics are still under the fixed illusion that they cure often, you know, with titanium and, and artificial joints and stuff. But in internal medicine, you know, I, I just sort of doctor with people. First do no harm and then comfort always. And if in the process of providing comfort, I start doing harm to a patient, then courts have found that that's inconsistent with the usual course of medical practice and inconsistent with a legitimate medical purpose. Even if the laminated MRI report that the patient brought, laminated because they use it in so many offices all over North America, that shows you know, basically um, cornflakes in their you know, lumbosacral spine area, even if the laminated MRI report looks terrible, um, if providing the opioids is doing harm to the patient, 
accidental overdoses, selling it, getting incarcerated, um, uh, altering prescriptions, doing all the kinds of things that people with addiction when they're out of control are doing. Um, that actually is considered uh, prescribing outside the usual course of medical practice for other than legitimate medical purpose. Ugh. So anyway, there's some more about medical purposes, but you guys have this, I think, in your handout. So. So what are scams? Scams are things that people, when they're out of control with controlled drugs, use to try to increase their access. So they, they basically involve pressuring a relationship to further another relationship. Um, the scam that we all saw on television um, was the, uh, was the uh, one brought to us by Anheuser-Busch, uh, Miller Beer. Big sort of heavy set guy in a flannel shirt and, and, uh, and overalls, looking a little scruffy, holding a fishing pole. Um, starts sort of choking up during the beer commercial and he looks off camera and he says, you know daddy, I really love you daddy. And then they opened up the, the frame and his dad was sitting next to him, same plaid shirt, same overalls, 30 years older, 30 pounds lighter, looking better than him, than his son. And his dad looks back at him and says, say what you will son, but you can't have my Bud Light. And everybody goes, ah, oh, 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 oh. that's Anheuser-Busch advertising alcoholic family behavior as normative to America. Faking love for your father to beat him out of a six pack of beer is called alcoholism. <laughs> now that's it, but, but, but Anheuser-Busch wants people to think, oh that's just Uncle Bud, he's just a beer drinking boy. No, he's not, he's an alcoholic, he needs to go to detox for God's sake. <laughs> he looks like he fell through a garbage disposal. Jeez, oh Pete. But that same guy on Tuesday morning is sitting on a dock, me, by the throat saying, Doc, I really love you, Doc. You're the only physician who's ever really listened to me. You care, not like the rest of the, I told you I'd never ask you for an early Percocet prescription again. I know I told you, I know I promised. But you know, I parked in that UH garage. It's such a skeevy place, that university hospitals. I went to anesthesia grand rounds. And somebody busted into my truck right there in the parking garage and they stole my Percocet right out. I always take my Percocet to work with me because I go to one-to-one -to because -one you told me I have to exercise and I always have to take a little bit after I go to one-to-one -to -one because my back is killing me after that and I'm so sorry and here's my, here's my police report from the UCI police. So, spilled the bottle. I've been practicing, again, I've been, pers I've been practicing medicine for 36 years and uh, two months and 26 or seven days, however, whatever day it is in the month right now. And I've never had a patient spill a bottle of blood pressure pills ever, <laughs> ever, in three and a half decades. Uh, the dog ate it. You can't beat a dog into eating hydrocodone. If, has anyone ever had to give a, give a, um, oh, a heartworm pill to a dog? You know, they won't eat it. And so you roll it up in bologna so they nose it around on the floor till it's out of the bologna, they eat the bologna. They lick the cheese off of it and then you finally just grab them by the jaw and open up and just jam it in. And you really don't care if they aspirate it or not <laughs> uh, at that point. Um, lost the prescription. Again, I've never had a patient lose a prescription for anything related to the management of diabetes ever. Washed in the laundry, my medicines were stolen. Left it in West Virginia. There's something about my DEA number in West Virginia. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But people are constitutionally unable to return to Ohio from West Virginia with my controlled drugs. I, I don't know why. Um, the dirtbag pharmacist shorted me. You know, they wrote 60 on the bottle, but there's no way there was more than 48 in there, Dr. Perrin. I didn't know that was a felony. It's a felony to write 60 on a bottle and only put 48 in there. And if a pharmacist is caught with a felony, they lose their license for life. So pharmacists don't short patients. They write 48 on the bottle. If I write for 60 and they only have 48, they write 48 on the bottle. And they call me and say, I only had 48. And the script is filled. So if you want the last 12, you'll have to write a new prescription and I get my new shipments of meds in on Tuesday. And that's the way a pharmacist uh, behaves. It's the only thing that helps. Oh, by the way, somebody curbsiding you. You know, I'm flying to Europe. I'm giving a big talk. I'm a little short of my Ambien. Can you just write me a script? Newsflash. 
don't ever write a controlled drug prescription to anybody ever without a chart because it's against the law. It's just against the law. And in Ohio, you're not allowed to write for family, close friends, or quote unquote close associates. And they haven't defined what close associates are, but it's generally considered people in your practice, employees and, uh, and people in your practice. You can't write a controlled drug prescription. You know, if you're writing for amoxicillin or something for people, it's a bad idea, but it's not illegal. But it's illegal to write for Ambien uh, for a friend who's flying to Europe uh, who you'd, where you don't have a chart. You need a chart. Now, if you just put a chart together in your living room and keep it in a drawer in your study, at least that's a chart. So if you get audited, you can say, well, here's the history, and they were flying to Europe, and blah, 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 but you've got to have a chart. Blah, 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 blah. So how do you deal with scams? Don't give early refills, don't give early refills, don't give early refills. If I forgot to mention it, don't give early refills. Again, if in 35 years I haven't had to do a single early refill for anything related to asthma, high blood pressure, or diabetes, I certainly shouldn't give early refills for controlled drugs. There shouldn't be anything special about them, other than that they're abusable, um, that should cause me to give early refills. Don't get all don't catch an attitude when a person asks you for an early refill. Just stay a doctor. Don't sort of get huffy and say, no, and you're fired, you know, and I think you're a dirtbag addict and get out of my office and all this other stuff that I've heard my colleagues say. Because um, then you can endanger yourself or your family or your car in the parking lot. A friend of mine yelled, cussed out a patient. She got in trouble with the medical board because she just couldn't say no had to come to our intensive course in controlled drug prescribing, a remedial three-day course on how to say no if you need to. And uh, so a patient came and tried to beat her out of an early prescription refill, and she told the patient that she was a pseudo-patient, not a real patient, because she was trying to get drugs out of her. She thought that was brilliant, a pseudo-patient. Because um, she was angry, because she'd been embarrassed by the medical board and had to go to a remedial CME course. And then she told the patient, you're probably, you know, you're probably defrauding Medicaid and, and, uh, and welfare, and I'm going to report you to the narcotics detectives and to Medicaid and to welfare. And the patient took half a swing at her, stormed out of the office, turned a couple chairs over in the waiting room. And on the way home that night, my friend had $7,000 worth of damage to her car in the parking lot. So, you know, just, just say, no, I'm so sorry, but no. So here's, this is the only skill practice, so everybody... Prepare. You can lip sync but you, and, and not make noise, but so if a person asks you for an early prescription refill, the bottom line is you have to look at them with an empathic look on your face, whether you feel it or not, and say, I'm so sorry, but no. I'm so sorry, but no. Early refills aren't safe. Early refills aren't safe. So I'm just not allowed. So I'm just not allowed. It's not, it's not tough. But if you look at the first edition of the Annals 2016, so January 1st, 2016, Annals of Internal Medicine, 90% of people in a huge HMO in, in uh, Massachusetts where they think they do world-class care uh, compared to here where they think we do Ohio care. But if you're in Boston, you do world-class care, universe-class care probably in Boston. <laughs> 90% of people with an accidental overdose on their prescription opioids continued to receive opioids after their overdose from the person who prescribed before. 90%. 30% got a higher dose after their overdose. Because people just have a tough time saying, I'm so sorry, but no. All right, so let me uh, talk about uh, acute pain and addiction. Um, and this is what addiction consultants do on med surge services like all day, every day. We get paged all the time. We got this patient with addiction. What should we do about their pain? And so this is what we think about. First, we say to ourselves, is there a clear acute pain diagnosis? And is it a diagnosis that warrants opioids? That's the first question. And we usually ask you guys, you know, we say, well, let's talk to anesthesia or let's talk to the surgeons, you know. Is it an acute pain diagnosis? Is it clear? And is fibromyalgia a clear diagnosis? I don't know. I think it might have been called chronic fatigue syndrome in the past and hypoglycemia in 1978 when I was a first year med student, but I'm not sure. Um, but is it a clear diagnosis? 
And is it the kind of diagnosis that would warrant an opioid in anyone else because it's severe enough? So that's the first question. The second question is, is non-opioid treatment inappropriate or has it failed? So if it's inappropriate, you know, if, if it's a person sitting there in the burn unit with 60% third degree burns having to get tubbed two or three times a day, uh, that's sort of a pretty clear diagnosis with a pretty clear reason for opioids and it would be pretty inappropriate to wave a little Tylenol and Motrin in front of that patient uh, with some relaxation tapes. Um, the third question is what's the assessment of the addiction because that indicates, that lets you know whether a person is some risk, moderate risk or high risk. And then consider prescribing the opioid. So how do you assess the, the addiction? My first question with addiction is are they in remission or is it active addiction? And contrary to sort of your typical thinking or my typical thinking, people with active addiction are at lower risk for getting opioids than people in recovery especially if they have a history of opiate addiction in the past. The highest risk person on earth to give a single unit dose of hydrocodone to is a person with a history of opioid addiction who's currently sober. That's the highest risk possible person on earth you could hallucinate to have to give an opioid to. Um, because giving a single unit dose of hydrocodone to a person with previous opiate addiction who's currently sober is like giving a shot of gin to a person who's walked out of an AA meeting. It honestly is just like it. Um, so are they in remission? Are they in relapse? And have opioids ever been one of their primary drugs of addiction? Or have they primarily been addicted to sedative hypnotics, beer, wine, liquor, and benzos, or psychostimulants, uh, cocaine, etc.? So those are basically the questions that go through our mind when we show up to do an addiction consult. Um, consider a consultation with pain management or uh, a specialist or somebody who's an addiction specialist. How do you know if people have addiction? Well, that's the to topic for an, an entirely different um, uh, Tuesday morning talk. I'd be happy to come back and give one. How, what do you do about chronic pain in people with addiction? The topic for a, a completely different talk. I'd be happy to come back and give one of those in the future. Um, but this is what I do to screen for addiction. I ask the patient about addiction. I ask the family whether the patient's had addiction. I check a tox screen. Um, and I check an ORS report. That's what I do. It's not very hard. Um, and I can find 85 to 90 percent of people with a history of addiction just by doing that. Um, so these are the flavors that patients come in. It's basically vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, um, rum raisin, and uh, maybe uh, butter pecan. There's about five different scenarios that you can think of about acute pain and a patient with addiction. So here's one. Acute pain and a patient with active non-opiate addiction. So this is the person with uh, an acute pain syndrome post-op with cocaine in their urine. And you ask them about opiates, they say, I don't do opiates, but I really have a tough time with that cocaine, doc. And methamphetamine is just about peachy keen areno. And if you'd prescribe me some Adderall, I'd probably do it up IV. Um, that's a stimulant addict. So a person with stimulant addiction and acute pain, um, certainly, number one, get a chemical dependency consult. Any patient with addiction, get a chemical dependency consult. Um, uh, number two, identify the typical dose and duration, D and D, of opiate that you would give to anybody else with this kind of acute pain syndrome. And then give it to them but give it to them with some controls. So instead of sending them home with a 10-day course of an opioid or a seven-day course now that we live in the great state of Ohio, and we're not supposed to give more than seven days of, a, of an acute pain uh, medication, instead of a seven-day course for a person with cocaine addiction, they may have pretty bad pain, but if they can sell their Percocet for some cocaine, they might well do it especially once they take a couple Percocet and ease their pain, then the rest of the Percocet start feeling a little discretionary uh, to the cocaine addicted brain. And so you write a prescription for two days with two refills and let the pharmacy stand between the patient and the drug, not the family. So, you know, consider a surrogate like the pharmacist, not necessarily the family. So a small amount um, that can be refilled. That's what I would do. But in the hospital, we just say, well, what would you give to anybody else? 
with this, and then you guys tell us, and we say, that's what we think we should do. Um, and then we get paid for a consult, which is unbelievable. Um, acute pain and active opiate addiction. This is the person who's currently using opiates and has you know, uh, perfed an appendix or done whatever they've done and they've wound up in the hospital with an acute pain syndrome, maybe really bad cellulitis or a big old abscess or something. Um, refer for chemical dependency treatment. Get an addiction consult. Estimate their tolerance. So you have to, when you're dealing with a current active person with opiate addiction, it's kind of like playing poker. If you want to stay in the game in poker and someone else has put down a bet, you got to meet them. I mean, you got to sort of cover that bet and then raise them if you want to raise. But you got to cover their heroin addiction with an opioid because that's their baseline tolerance. And then you have to raise them to take care of the acute pain phenomenon. And the raise you give should be identical to the typical dose and duration you would give to anyone else with that acute pain syndrome. But it is a little hard to estimate the heroin. It is a little hard to estimate the tolerance. Um, and this is the perfect patient to use injectable buprenorphine. It is the single best opioid to treat the hospitalized opiate addict. Not the sublingual buprenorphine. That's a very blunt tool. And the absorption, I mean the blood levels, completely depend on absorption which depends on how long a person's able to hold saliva under their tongue. So everyone, just for a minute here, <coughs> gin up a little saliva here. Come on, get some saliva and hold it under your tongue and swallow it when I tell you to swallow it, okay? And if you can hold it there until I tell you to swallow it and don't swallow in between, you'll get an optimal serum level from sublingual buprenorphine. So hold that saliva for, I won't because I'll spit all over myself, but um, hold that saliva, don't swallow. Um, so injectable bu buprenex is the drug of choice for these people. And I start with 0.3 IMQ4. And I check them in an hour. So how do you check them in an hour? Well, I don't walk in with my white coat and say, how's your pain? Because they'll open one eye, they'll see a white coat, and they'll say 12. Asking a person with opiate addiction if they have enough pain relief yet when you're using an opioid is, ask, is like asking a person on Maui during their honeymoon, you know, do you want to call it quits and head back to work early? I mean, the opiate addicted brain cannot give accurate assessment of pain. Everyone else can, but the opiate addicted brain cannot accurately assess pain. So you have to look at them before they know you're looking at them or I prefer to use housekeeping. Um, I ask the housekeeper on the, on the ward to just check in you know, up on one of the towers to, to go take a peek at the patient in such and such bed and let me know how they look. Because when the housekeeper walks in, the patient doesn't suddenly think I'm being assessed to see if I look comfortable or not. Whereas when the nurse or the doc walks in or anyone else in the team, the patient automatically um, starts you know, behaving the way that they you know, consider they should behave um, in order to get what they think they need, what they honestly truly believe they need. So housekeeping is perfect. I say, just go in and, you know, fake like you're empty, empty in the trash can. Take a quick look at the patient. Tell me how they look. And if they're watching TV and talking on the phone, they're good. You know, their pain's a two or three, even if they say it's a 12. Um, and if they're curled up in bed, looking uncomfortable, sort of fidgeting around, then I didn't pick enough buprenorphine and I have to up the dose. And you get your peak effect an hour after the dose. So I have somebody look at them an hour after the dose. And if they're cooked, they're cooked. They're getting enough relief. And then you can taper the buprenorphine while they're in the hospital. And then when you send them home, you can have transitioned them to a, a weaker opioid uh, um, mu agonist, like perhaps uh, a tramadol, and send them home with a weak supply of tramadol, you know, two days at a time with refills for the opiate addict who has an acute pain syndrome. So this is what we do all day, every day with people with opioid addiction who are in the hospital. Um, and it works great. And if they say they're allergic to buprenorphine, that's just because they want Dilaudid. So I say, that's fine. We'll pre-treat you with 50 milligrams of IV Benadryl before we give the buprenorphine. Well, they say, well, I won't take that. I said, well, then I'm sorry. But you know, we'll keep asking you about your pain 
but that's what's available. That is the safe medicine that's available. Your brain's decision making about what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate for your pain is something that I'll listen to and I'll care about, but I won't build it into my clinical reasoning when you're dealing with an opiate addicted brain and opiates are on the table. That's just the reality. And then ooze empathy all over the place and uh, let the patient know you really care about them and tell them, don't worry. Once, number one, you're having your pain, and number two, you're in withdrawal, which will magnify the pain. The buprenorphine will really work then. I mean, geez, oh, Pete, it'll treat your withdrawal and it'll relieve your pain, and you'll think it's the best stuff on earth. Um, the one mistake that I've made in the past with buprenorphine, 1985, October, the first month I ran an addiction consult service. I gave 0.3 of buprenorphine IM to a patient about 45 minutes after he'd gotten 150 milligrams of IM Demerol for his acute sickle cell crisis pain. And I reversed the intense euphoria of Demerol with a weak euphoria of buprenorphine. The patient woke up from his Demerol buzz, looked at the nurse and said, whatever shot you just gave me, I'm allergic. Um, and we didn't really precipitate withdrawal, but we sure took the tie off of the Demerol buzz. And so if you're switching from a full mu agonist to buprenorphine, wait six hours. All right, this is the person I worry about all the time. A guy I saw, oh, two and a half, three years ago. On crutches, huge guy, played Division I college football, messed up his knee first semester, sophomore year. Um, found out he liked hydrocodone better than college or football. Um, wound up flunking out of college with opiate addiction, sold heroin for a while, got sober, went back to college, got a bachelor's degree, had a master's in addiction counseling, was the counseling supervisor in an addiction treatment program in Northeast Ohio, and now, 15 years later, his knee had deteriorated to the point he was on crutches and needed a total knee. And he said, I'm afraid. And this was before you guys had those ice machines that you guys just like run forever until people almost get frostbite. Um, and he said, I'm really afraid. And I said, don't worry, we'll use a kappa agonist. We'll ask anesthesia to use a non-opioid anesthetic. You know, put them out with whatever you put them out with, but don't touch the mu receptor. And as soon as you come off, and, or, or if you're not putting them out, put whatever in the back you're going to put it in, and leave it in the back for as long as you possibly can until just be before they become septic, uh, and then pull it out of their back. So leave it in a long, long time if possible. Um, and then we'll switch you to a kappa agonist, because you're in love with mu agonists. So we'll use a kappa agonist. And it was all fine until 2 in the morning when a sleep-deprived orthopedic house officer, nothing personal, uh, to the orthopedic house officer, um, saw the chart and said, God, here's a person with a total knee who's not on PCA, and ordered up a morphine PCA pump or some kind of full mu agonist PCA pump at 2 a.m. When I saw that patient at 6 a.m. on rounds, he had pushed the button on his PCA pump 12 years sober with a master's in addiction counseling. He had pushed his PCA button more than, than the entire rest of the orthopedic floor combined between 6, 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. And when I had the nurse come in and told her in front of me to take away the PCA pump, he cursed at me and talked about my family lineage. The same guy who'd seen me six weeks pre-op saying, I'm scared to death of relapsing with addiction. And I didn't take it personal. I just smiled and said, I know, and walked out. And we waited a while for the, for the mu to wear off and put him on a kappa agonist and then, you know, stepped him down. And he did fine, and he thanks me all the time. But he was rolling with addiction four hours after starting on a full IV mu agonist. So these people, I just desperately try to stay away from mu agonists, if at all possible. All right, so this is the last one that I'll go over with you. This is the patient who's in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, sedative hypnotic addiction, alcohol, 20 years sober, but he still keeps smoking, and now he needs coronary artery bypass surgery. I mean, it's sort of the, you know, <laughs> the natural history of alcoholism is called cabbage, because uh, they all keep smoking. Um, and he's scared to death. And I tell him, don't worry. Uh, take whatever your doctor gives you after surgery. Take it for as long as anyone else needs it. If you wind up with a chronic post-sternotomy 
pain syndrome, don't take opiates. Chronic pain in a person with a history of alcoholism shouldn't be treated with opiates or cocaine. But in acute pain syndrome, just give them whatever you'd give for anything else. Tell their sponsor they're going for surgery. Tell their family to look at them carefully if they start acting weird around their pain meds post-op. And don't give it any longer than you would give it to anybody else. Um, and, uh, and it works fine. So when it comes to chronic pain, high-risk drugs are dangerous to patients with high-risk brains, period. And we're not allowed to do dangerous stuff with patients. If we were allowed to do dangerous stuff with patients, we'd be treating everybody in North America with chloramphenicol right now who had an, who had an infection. Because it's a great antibiotic. But it, you know, it kills one out of 200,000 people from aplastic anemia. So we don't give chloramphenicol to anybody uh, in North America. The risk of giving chronic controlled drugs to a patient with an addictive brain is way higher than one in 200,000. Uh, in fact, the risk is very, very high. So no chronic controlled drugs to people with chronic pain who have addiction. But people with acute pain with addiction, ask yourself, is it active addiction or is it in remission? And if it's active, what are the drugs of choice? What are the current active drugs that the patient loves? And if it's not opioids, don't worry. Use whatever you would use for anybody else for exactly how long you would give it to anyone else. But when you provide the prescriptions, provide them in small amounts with refills and let the pharmacy stand between the patient and a substantial supply of meds. Um, if a patient has a history of opiate, active opiate addiction, you have to meet their tolerance and then add analgesia on top in order to treat their acute pain syndrome. If a patient comes in on Suboxone or Methadone, leave them on their Suboxone and Methadone to take care of their tolerance and then add on top of it whatever you would give for acute pain syndromes on top of it. And pray to God they have a good Suboxone doctor who has them on 12 milligrams or less. Patients on 24 to 32 milligrams of Suboxone are pretty well saturated and there isn't much you can do from a mu agonist standpoint, even with high affinity mu agonists like fentanyl to give much analgesia. Anybody on 32 milligrams of buprenorphine a day has a bad doctor uh, who ought to be reported to the medical board so they get some remedial education. Because uh, people do fine on eight and four and 12. But if people on eight and four and 12 of buprenorphine, just keep them on their buprenorphine, it's sublingual when they're NPO that's okay. And by the way, if you've swallowed since I asked you not to swallow, you didn't get your full dose of buprenorphine for the day. Um, you have to hold it sublingual for 10 to 15 minutes uh, to get the full dose absorption. Just leave them on their sublingual buprenorphine and then give them any other mu agonist on top of it that you want. Or increase the buprenorphine. Either one works fine uh, to treat their pain. And on that happy note, let me quit. Thanks very much. <laughs>